do the management introductions over to you sunil thank you rahul good evening everybody and a warm welcome on the kpit technologies q4 and fy22 earnings uh, call on the call today we have mr ravi pandit our chairman uh, kishor patil ceo and md sachin tikekar joint md uh, priya adikar cfo and uh, sunil from investor relations uh, i hope you have all uh, received our investor update and gone through it in detail Uh, as we do we'll have the opening remarks uh, by mr pandit on uh, the overall performance of the company and the way forward and post his opening remarks we'll have the floor open for questions so i would once again welcome you all and hand it over to mr pandit uh, thank you sunil uh, and welcome to all of you so in my initial comments um, what i would like to do is to um, uh, talk about the last quarter uh, the last year Uh, I'll spend a minute or so talking about the trends over the last uh, couple of years. I would then want to talk about the global customer trends and the workforce trends because I am certain you would like to know how do we see the future uh, of our work. Uh, and then I would like to talk about what is our next year's outlook and give you a flavor of the company that we are building. And uh, <coughs> as soon as mentioned, post that uh, we can go into. Uh, Uh, the question answer session so um, as soon as mentioned you probably have already seen our investor update for q4 2022 and fy 2022 and i hope you are happy uh, with the performance that our company has delivered so uh, if i were to look at the last quarter uh, we have had an all round growth of uh, revenue ebitda pat cash uh, etc so uh, the revenue growth was uh, 5.2% on a quarter on quarter basis and 21% on a year on year same quarter basis at constant currency this of course uh, understates uh, the volume growth to which i'll come in a short while or ebitda um, grew 5.6% uh, quarter on quarter and 30% at um, on a year on year basis and is now at 18.6% uh, the pat uh, has grown 12.7% on quarter on quarter 50% actually on year on year same quarter and is now at 12.1%. Uh the the cash balance now is 1038 crores. Uh this is uh, you know post the dividend payment that we made if you remember we did the interim dividend uh, some time back. And in this quarter also as we have announced uh we got a large deal with a fund in 25 million dollars in addition to a specific large deal of 70 million euros. Uh, we are ending the year with a staff of uh, about 8,250 people. All in all, the quarter was good. This kind of um, uh, came on top of uh, a good last year. And let me just quickly look at the last year. Our revenue uh, for the whole year was 328 million dollars. EBIT of 438 crores. PAT of 274 crores. The revenue growth was 19.7 percent constant currency. <laughs> But you know, I think it is important to recognize that this was accompanied by almost an 8% shift to offshoring, and uh, I think the volume growth was in the region of 28%, uh, which of course you have seen, uh, you know, its result on the EBITDA and on the PAT. So EBITDA grew by 41%, PAT by 88%. Uh, we, as, I, as I said earlier, we have a healthy cash balance. Actually, 79% of our balance sheet uh, is uh, cash. The return on equity has improved from 12.1% last year to 20.9. The EPS from 5.4 rupees per share to 10.05, and uh, you will be happy to note that we have increased our dividend uh, from 1.85 uh, rupees per share to 3.1, while still having a conservative dividend payout ratio of roughly 31%. Our growth has been balanced. Uh, US now accounts for 39% of our top line. Europe 40%, Asia about 21%. Tax cars 74%, commercial vehicles uh, 26%. The growth is spread across our practices, both new as well as old, and we have incubated some new practices during the year uh, to be in step with the needs of our clients. Uh, the C21 customers with whom on whom we have a large focus account for almost 84% of our revenues. that um, is really the summary of the last year if one were to look at the last couple of years <coughs> so 
So we have now delivered seven quarters of continuous revenue growth and margin expansions and 12 quarters of uh, net cash increase. Over the last seven quarters, our EBITDA margin has grown from 13.4% to 18.6%. Net cash has grown from 0.9 billion rupees to uh, 10.38 billion. And the quarterly revenues have grown from 65 million to 87 million. And now we have top 21 clients who are really the who's and who, who's who of the automotive world. And for many of these, we are their core strategic partners working in areas that define their future. Since our strategic action of merger and demerger, we believe that we have created value for our clients, for you, our investors, and for our staff. And I would like to thank you for your continued support. Now, while this talks about the last year and maybe two years, I'm certain that you are keen to understand how do we look at the industry in which we are operating. So I would like to spend a few minutes talking about the global customer trends because that might give you a peek into how we look at our future. We believe that we are witnessing the most transformative period in the life of our industry, the mobility industry. And this is so actually in the last 100 years, things have not changed as they are changing now. You would recollect that we have been talking for the past few years about case, which is you know, connected, autonomous, shared, and electric as the drivers of change in the mobility industry. In the last one year, all of these have trends, all these trends have been converging into a new phenomenon, which can be rightly called the software defined vehicle. So you know, recently, we had computers inside a car. Now we have a car around the computers. The computers, the computers are actually becoming the core of every vehicle, which actually is very aptly described by the term software defined vehicle. So the question is, what changes are driving this? Why is it that people are talking? Why is it that the industry is talking about software de defined vehicle? And I think there are a few reasons, a few drivers for this change. First is, of course, uh, a desire to build an intelligent vehicle, a vehicle which is aware and responsive to the environment. And second is the, the, the need to build agile systems, which are highly responsive, which can be uh, uh, which can be uh, changed over the air. The auto companies now believe that data monetization is their way forward. So they are not looking at a situation where there is a one-time sale of a vehicle and thereafter there is no connect with the customer. Instead, now there is a realization that the automotive, the car uh, delivers data all the time and the uh, auto OEMs would like to partake in the monetization of that data. There is also a need for a better cost control, and there is a need to drive the speed of change. Now, all these drivers are actually being are, are actually making a big change in the automotive industry. So, what are the changes that are now being made? So, clearly, there is a change in the vehicle architecture. You know, from a situation where there was decentralized computing inside a car, sometimes having almost 110, 130 ECUs. Now there is a movement towards the zonal architecture where you may have four or five computers and this is on way to go to a central compute platform. This means a big change in the computer architecture and a large opportunity for a company like us to participate in this transformation. There is also a movement towards agile technologies because you know, the world is realizing that this industry is going to change fast. That means all the software functionalities in a car will have to change fast and therefore the technologies have to be agile, and therefore it is going to make a change in the programming languages that are there. There is a huge change in the industry interfaces. <clears throat> there is now a much tighter linkage with the semicon industry. We all have heard about the semicon shortages, and we also heard about the desire of a lot of auto companies to get into at least some kind of semicon manufacturing. But over and beyond that, there is a need for a much closer collaboration and cooperation between these two industries, which again creates opportunities for a company like us, which is really engaged in the world of integration. All these changes in the architecture or in the way in which the cars are going to be operated is also making a change in the organizational structure inside the auto companies. There is a consolidation of embedded software 
programs across the application domain. And there is an increasing complexity because of this. This calls for deep domain knowledge, <laughs> the appropriate technology assets and skills. Now, it is important to note that these changes are happening both in bad cards as well as in trucks, both of which are our clients. So, so what does it mean for a software developer and integrator like us? You know, it needs, means that now our clients are clearly seeing need for partners <coughs> and not for vendors. Now, this is just has been our philosophy of working with our clients. We have been looking at deep partnerships, and now there is a growing realization on the on the part of the auto companies also that they, they need partners who would work with them through a long period of time. They are also looking for partners who bring deep competency, which is what we have been investing in when we are looking at platform tools and accelerators. And as we have, as we have been telling you that over the years we have been making investments in this year after year. The car companies look for a partner <laughs> who can be depended upon. And our credo is actually reimagining mobility with you, that you really stand for the partnership that is at the core of our working. This is a reimagining mobility for with you, for a cleaner, safer, and smarter world. And our goal, and which, which is what we stated a few years ago, our goal has been to build a company focused on mobility, a company which knows software better than any auto company, and which knows auto better than any software company. And that is the that's the area where we are playing. And I think now we see greater and greater potential for a role like this. We believe that we are at the right place and right time, and we are making every effort to play our rightful role in these exciting times. So now this is what is happening in the overall industry. <laughs> Just as there are changes in the industry, there are changes in the workforce. Actually, very tumultuous changes. So aided by electronics and telecommunications, the telecommunication revolutions, and accelerated by COVID, major changes are happening in the world of the workforce. We believe that the days of large centralized workplaces with fixed work time are changing. And these changes in many industries, whether in mobility industry or finance, whether in like logistics or even food, is creating huge demand for software talent. And we now have a situation where the demand for talent far exceeds the supply. And this is resulting in the high attrition and turmoil that you see across the industry. We believe that this will take a few years to calm down. We expect that the attrition will continue to be in the mid-20s. And we are learning to deliver our growth despite the staff situation. And we are looking at multiple um, ways in which we will handle this. We are looking at global centers. We are looking at local centers. We are looking at hiring of freshers and training them rapidly. We are working on diversified staff covenants, accounting for lifestyle changes in different life stages of our people. We are tapping our alumni network. We are strengthening our referral programs. We are doing a lot of work on automation and also better processes for work management in the new paradigm. We believe that this new paradigm is going to stay and we are working our way forward to succeed in this new area. Now let me look at the next year's outlook. <clears throat> As we have stated, we are looking at growth between 18 to 20 to 21% constant currency in terms of revenue, 18 to 19% EBITDA margin, and about 25% volume growth. And you know, embedded in this is all the continuous investments that we have been doing to make our growth in the long term sustainable. I would urge you to look at our company beyond our numbers. You know, we have set out to build a company which has deep social commitment and a commitment to integrity. Our social commitment is for every society in which we work, whether it is USA or Germany or China or Japan. And we are working in the area of education, environment, energy, and engagement. And these are the areas which are very core to us. We have been working on education, especially in the field of science and technology, because we believe that the society, a society cannot improve without the use of science and technology. And I would urge you to look at the work that we are doing for educating people, students at various levels from school to college to PhD, for improving the knowledge of science and technology. We also do a lot of work on environment, 
Of course, the work for improvement of environment is embedded in every software that we deliver, whether it is related to a clean software, clean uh, automotives or connected automotives or shared automotives, etc. But environmental considerations are also embedded in the way in which we work. We work for green energy, and in all these areas, we have a deep commitment of our own people. And it's our commitment to build a company which is a good global citizen. So this is to tell you about how we see the uh, recent past, our future immediate as well as distant, and what is the type of company that we want to build. I want to thank you for a patient listening. We are now open for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. A reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one at this time. First question is from the line of Karan Uppal from Philip Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the opportunity and congratulations on a very good set of numbers. So, first Thank question you. is on the deal wins. Uh, so, deal wins you reported this quarter was about 125 million. Uh, so, just wanted to check that whether uh, you are winning uh, all are from the T21 clients or have you started winning uh, deals outside the T21? And uh, what is the normal deal uh, deal win uh, for any particular quarter? Uh, if you can give us some sense, and what is the pipeline overall? So uh, uh, our focus has been on T21, uh, T25 as uh, we say, and T21 uh, currently uh, figured out. So most of these wins would be uh, for T21. Even the large uh, deal which we have uh, mentioned is also about the you know, from this client. We have not uh, been uh, reporting any other numbers in terms of the pipeline or uh, you know deal wins. Uh, from this quarter, uh, we have decided that we will uh, start sharing the numbers in terms of business during the quarter. In line with that, uh, we have announced that. So every quarter, we will give you this number. I think this is what we can share, which should give you some idea about uh, the business environment. As we are giving the clear outlook on the revenue and uh, the EBITDA margins, I, uh, we would uh, uh, request you to go by that. Uh, this at least gives you some confidence about uh, the direction in which we are focusing. Okay, okay. Yeah, thanks. I very uh, appreciate uh, you sharing the reason DC number. Uh, the second question was on the margin guidance. Uh, so a very strong guidance from, from your side. So I just wanted to understand what are the levers to sustain the margins at current levels? Uh, you know, despite, you know, the costs like uh, uh, travel facility and overall it, high attrition environment continuing. So what are the levers for you to sustain the margins? So uh, as we have, uh, as Mr. Pandit mentioned, we have shown the increase in the um, uh, EBITDA margins uh, over last uh, seven quarters. Uh, so there are two, three things uh, which will really drive the margins. Uh, uh, the number one, uh, of course, uh, is uh, the revenue growth, which always uh, gives you a lever. The second, uh, which is very important, as we talked about, our volume growth is higher, and that uh, really drives uh, a better margin. And the third is a higher realization. So I think uh, we have been in a position to, uh, to do work in multiple ways, to use our uh, assets, we use our uh, uh, different business models um, and the productivity. Uh, by which uh, bringing a higher realization. As uh, we have mentioned, uh, more and more uh, uh, you know uh, projects we are undertaking which are uh, more managed uh, uh, services as well as uh, the other business models which allows us to increase our realization. Also, many of most of our work uh, is also in a very pretty, um, if I would say, cutting edge technology that allows us to also increase our realization. So with that, uh, we believe we should be in a position to increase our, uh, um, uh, we, we should be in a position to absorb uh, the additional cost uh, which we have. We do have uh, other leverages on the cost side also. Uh, and uh, still, uh, I believe, uh, 
as compared to uh, many other uh, cases i think uh, we have a margin uh, we have an ability to uh, still bring more operating efficiency which, uh, which we will bring during the year okay thank thank you lot for answering my questions and all the best for effect thank you thank you thank you the next question is from the line of chandra mauli muthaya from goldman sachs please go ahead hi good evening and thank you for taking my questions uh, my first question is around the headcount increases i think we've gone from 6700 employees a couple of quarters back to almost 8200 employees now I understand most of these are freshers so just trying to understand as you compete for talent at um, colleges in india what are some of the skills in addition to coding that you're looking for in the workforce that you're hiring from campus in color there would be helpful so uh, there are two three things first we have uh, also built a relationship just like clients with uh, universities uh, we have uh, developed uh, some of these relationships much before uh, you know uh, we we run uh, many uh, contacts uh, we have a, a program uh, which uh, basically uh, which which basically uh, starts from the days when the people are uh, doing innovation in their college days uh, from there uh, we from the we start engaging with the uh, with the people uh, from uh, the when they are in the year 2 or 3 and we make uh, that is a general uh, what you can say skill development program we have and at the in the in the uh, fourth uh, year is when we make the offer so we actually have a pretty well connect with the um, you know students uh, in most of the cases not all the cases but in most of the cases generally learnability is what uh, we are looking for we are looking for passion for automotive these are the two very important uh, uh, reasons why we hire people got it that's helpful uh, second question is uh, just around what percentage of business today would you say is from new age oems and semiconductor companies and understand you're working with uh, working on pilot projects with companies like rivian lucid neo renaissance so if you could just give us some clarity on you know at this point what percentage of revenues is coming from these two uh, se- segments hi hi this is sachin dikaker um as we mentioned uh, we are actually testing the water and uh, we are in the process of defining our strategy in the meantime uh, there are handful of uh, new age clients that we are working with so currently i would say it's about 3 to 4% um and obviously over a period of time uh, the revenue uh, will go up uh, however what is uh, most important at this point in time is um, we clearly define our value proposition to them and create large boulder that will create a sort of tremendous value for them and over a period of time that becomes a tremendous growth engine for us um, um as of now as as we can say the conventional uh, the, the 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 pipeline is tremendous is focusing on the conventional uh, oems that we have so the growth will be propelled by them for the next uh, few years but we believe that uh, you know we will continue to keep at uh, the new mobility and uh, in the next few years that will sort of uh, uh, create more growth opportunities for us so is it answer your question sure sure thanks sachin and just my last question if i could just squeeze in is around cash balance i think we've we've raised the cash balance by about 4x in the past 3 years so just trying to understand from a capital allocation standpoint how would you uh, define your capital allocation priorities if you were to sort of just bucket it between m and a dividend payout and and the investment in the business so uh, we have a, a dividend policy and we have mentioned about uh, in uh, next few years we will get to about 35% uh, of a payout ratio uh, we have been increasing slowly that uh, uh, number um and we feel comfortable with that uh, number as a payout for dividend we do believe that uh, for the growth we are looking at uh, and uh, you know if uh, in case of certain new technologies and areas where we may find uh, suitable uh, acquisition uh, companies 
then we will go for it we are very careful about it because uh, frankly right now uh, uh, we have we do have a client access and we are in a position where uh, we can reach out to any client in automotive and mobility and get that client so unless we find that there is a very niche technology which has been developed uh, and which will be very useful uh, for the our clients and for future uh, that's when we will look for uh, acquisitions uh, if at all uh, and uh, naturally this will be high quality companies so uh, we uh, you know as and when these opportunities come up we will use this uh, judiciously for this. got it thank you very much and all the best thank you the next question is from the line of nitin padmanabhan from investec please go ahead yeah hi good evening uh, congratulations on a strong quarter uh, i had a few questions so one is um, uh, uh, the large deal that we have won i think historically you have mentioned that Uh, uh when you get into software architecture deals it's not only it, it requires stitching multiple partners into the deal um you know, so in, in that sort of scenario are the uh, when we think about the profitability of these deals are they very similar to ex the existing business uh or was the first question or is it uh, better or, or worse uh, that's what i wanted to understand so uh, many of these uh, deals certainly are um, you know, where uh, there are more than one parties involved in many cases but the revenues which we are um, uh, recognizing and the revenues which we are reporting the purchase order is something which uh, kpit will deliver to the client uh, so this is uh, the uh, uh, you know at least the profitability will be the same as uh, what our normal business is sure that's helpful uh the second is um, i think this year our uh, uh, compared to the beginning of last year it appears the visibility is quite strong and we have had this last deal as well um and historically i think over the last 10 15 years whenever kepit has given a guidance even as a combined entity you have historically started the year and then q3 was usually a phase where by when you would get incremental visibility and then sort of change it that's at least been history now uh, when we go forward uh, i just wanted your thoughts on uh, in terms of the underlying momentum on revenue and deals uh, what is it that sort of giving more comfort is it the pipeline of larger deals or is it the existing velocity of business itself is so high uh, that even uh, you know without the last deal, i think fundamental to uh, uh, the visibility and our business as uh, mr pandit mentioned is we are uh, first is uh, our focus on clients basically uh, we are focusing only on uh, uh, in relatively short number of uh, clients right uh, t25 and uh, that uh, basically that is the core of our uh, strategy uh because of that we have uh, strategic relations with the clients they are looking at us as a partner uh, we are uh, engaged very deeply with them apart from the fact that we are engaged with their most of the uh, long term projects specifically in software defined vehicles and some of these areas that gives us a better understanding and visibility in terms of client spend as well as uh, uh, you know uh, 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 client pain uh, in addition to that uh, what we have mentioned as you have seen our uh, uh, orders which uh, we have uh, one during the quarter uh, along with the long dates uh, large dates uh, gives us that confidence so i think over the period uh, when we started 3 uh, years back i think we talked about t25 strategy and uh, more and more and every year i think uh, uh naturally our relationships are strong grown stronger uh with more and more clients so uh, uh, with more and more with this t25 clients so that is giving us more visibility and confidence so that's helpful that yeah. uh, yeah yes yes broadly yes uh, this one uh, data point if i may ask um we mentioned 120 uh, 5 odd million dollars of uh, deals apart from the 70 million euro deal um now any uh, could you give a sense in terms of 
how it was roughly last year is it much better than last year on that number excluding the last deal this is a, what we closed during the quarter and i think we will consistently give uh, what we have closed during the quarter i would not say this is abnormally high or low yes, sir fair enough thank you so much and all the best thank you thank you the next question is from the line of ankit agarwal from yellowstone equity please go ahead yeah hello thank thank you for the opportunity uh, my first question is uh, um i know uh, we are mostly into integration services uh, but uh, what about the other segment verification and valid- validation services i uh, just wanted to understand like is there any overlap between integration and verification validation are there any synergies and are there any revenues we're generating from verification and validation segment uh, i think it's a good question when we say we are our role is that of a software integrator if you look at a v cycle we operate on both cycles or both sides of the v that means we start with the requirement uh, actual development and the other side of v is actually validation and verification so when we say we are a, a software integrator um we work on any part of b or all of b depending on the program uh, so uh, to short answer to your question uh, validation and verification is uh, uh, a key area for us and we've been working on it for for many years now and will continue to do so um you know in in new vehicles as they get launched with new features vehicle and validation uh, becomes more and more critical especially going forward when we put um, uh, you know new technology such as uh, autonomous driving it actually calls for substantial uh, amount of verification and validation also uh, you can add uh, on the looking at the complexity of program this uh, becomes a very critical activity of integration actually uh, it takes more time than the development uh, before it gets into production and uh, that's where kpit's expertise is very critical to the client to shorten this time so we have developed multiple technologies uh, specifically areas where uh, uh, you you see areas where uh, you are seeing a semiconductor shortage and um, other areas where uh, the availability of uh, the infrastructure is uh, limited during that time how we can conduct uh, this kind of a uh, validation and testing uh, virtually is where uh, kpit has invested a lot and has a very deep expertise so it's a very much part of uh, our uh, software integration service okay okay interesting uh, okay the reason i was asking is like i was looking at one of your older presentations from august 2019 uh where you have given the mckinsey study uh, uh, uh statistics and the market price for verification and validation is shown as 10 billion dollars in 2020 versus 4 billion dollars in integration so is it fair to say that our target market is like 10 plus 4 so 14 billion dollars uh, as of 2020 that is right okay so in that case our market share would be around uh, uh, like 2 3% so we are barely scratching the surface does that mean that we uh, like how much of this market size is available to us like for our kind of services it's a very difficult question we do uh, track for our t25 clients uh, specifically and um, what we see generally is uh, i mean uh, they very difficult to give you the numbers uh, because they vary but what i can uh, say is uh, uh, the way we work with the t25 clients is where um, we engage at least in two areas if not three areas uh, specifically in a very uh, involved way uh, on the key projects with the client and where uh, typically our wallet share is uh, the highest for that client that's when we call a strategic relationship and that's how we have decided on t25 clients naturally there is a headroom uh, uh, both in terms of uh, some of the new services we can introduce also uh, gaining higher uh, market share uh, from the uh, newer spend okay okay understood understood very helpful uh, uh, just one more question uh, in the past you have mentioned some of the uh, platforms like mastro grn uh, uh could you give uh, like you don't like 
Sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Agarwal. The audio is breaking from your line. Please check. Yeah. You ask uh, the question again. We couldn't hear you well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Am I audible now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, in the past, you mentioned some of the names of your platforms, like Maximus Pro, JRM. Uh, can you elaborate more on them? Like, what kind of capabilities do you have? Uh, do they have? And we don't hear those names. Uh, we have not hear heard those names in a while. So, just uh, trying to understand, like, what uh, are those platforms still there? So, um, as you know, after uh, we brought in the focus, I think uh, there uh, we we are, we are focusing more on um, passenger car and commercial vehicles. Some of these platforms which we are developed are uh, very important uh, from the uh, future uh, business model of the client, uh, where they are looking at monetizing uh, the time of a uh, passenger in a car or a vehicle. So that's where uh, we we call it where uh, the clients, uh, our clients are trying to change the business model. Uh, they are looking at um, how they can, um, as Mr. Pandit mentioned, how we can monitor, how they can get more revenue uh, by delivering services uh, uh, rather than having revenue only at the point of sale of the vehicle. Uh, during that process, some of these uh, platforms are repurposed or reused or used in this way. There are, we do have one or two clients uh, which, uh, where we have even licensed these projects, products, uh, platforms, I would say. And there are certain revenues coming from them on a going basis. But looking at uh, where our key focus, and if you look at the uh, 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 wallet share of the client or wallet share of, uh, 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 in different buckets, this is a small percentage of our revenue for now. Okay. Understood, understood. And are we also looking to get into get more into design and development of uh, products over time, or will we focus more into services only? We we are focusing uh, more on uh, software integration services, as we discussed. Uh, we do the help in accelerating development uh, on the new platform, and specifically in the new architecture platform for the clients. Uh, KPIT has invested consistently uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, consistently over the last many years in terms of building platforms, accelerators, and tools, uh, which allows to uh, accelerate the development of our clients. So that is what we would do. We would not have shrinker app projects, products. Uh, that's not what we are looking at. And we are looking at uh, uh, helping them to develop uh, their applications quicker, faster, better, uh, and integrate that so that that can be taken to production uh, quickly and uh, um, uh, depend with, with a dependable uh, uh, with dependability. Okay, okay, understood. Uh, thank you for answering all my questions and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dave from Invest Yadla. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yes. So thank you for uh, taking my question. So uh, initially we see that uh, engines were the main drivers for automotive. Now software is driving the vehicles, right? So OEMs will also develop the their own in-house capability. So don't you think that your side of business will get Stringed when OEMs they start manuf um, delivering or uh, doing in-house develop development of their softwares. You know, um, it is true that OEMs would like to do uh, their own development of software, but um, the, ra the the rate at which the software technologies are changing uh, and the rate at which the complexity is increasing, it is not very easy uh, for every OEM uh, to build those skills. <laughs> That's why they are recognized that they need partners, and uh, our role is that of a partner, uh, which helps our client the OEM uh, to succeed in its marketplace. And I believe that um, it is very unlikely that every part of the software integration will be taken in-house by every OEM uh, in times to come. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.
The next question is from the line of Sangeeta Purushottam from Cogito Advisors. Please go ahead. Yeah, this is Andre Sangeeta Sparkham. I have two questions. Uh, first of all, you know, your revenue per employee or revenue developed per employee has shown a slight decrease over the slight quarters. Uh, could you explain what is happening there? Yeah, so, I mean, if you look at uh, the commentary, our offshore has been increasing over the last uh, four quarters or so. And uh, the revenue per employee obviously is a function of uh, the mix of revenues between onset and offshore. So, as a result, uh, the revenue per development employee has gone down due to increase in offshore, but uh, you can see the uh, effect on margins, where margins have improved uh, because of this shift. Uh, the other point is uh, during this period uh, we hire a uh, lot of uh, onboard, a lot of uh, uh, freshers uh, on board or onboarding happens when they become a productive bit later in our case. So that uh, also uh, has an impact on this. Right. And my second question was slightly more, uh, uh, more into the future. You know, with global inflation becoming a concern uh, across the world, uh, are you beginning to see that conversation seeping to in your discussions with OEM? And um, is, there, is there any flavor of that you can share with us? And is there any impact on your business? On the one hand, I would say you are uh, far more into long-term development of initiatives, so it should not uh, concern you overly in the short run. But I just wanted to get a sense from you as to whether this discussion is happening at all. I'm sorry, we didn't understand the first part of the question. You know, we talk about the global what? We say increasing inflation. inflation. Is there any impact on your business? I think that's a yes. You know, I was talking about global inflation. In global inflation entails higher interest rates and therefore a reduced demand in, in the auto industry as a whole. So, is, uh, is that in any way playing part in your conversation? Then, uh, just, I just want to see. Okay. So right now, uh, as uh, we mentioned, I think we are largely working on the programs which are for 2025-26. Uh, we are not uh, working on the vehicles which will be manufactured and delivered next year or year after. Uh, so most of our most of our programs are 2025-26 uh, and beyond. Uh, there is some work which uh, is there, but which is very essential to the continuing of the vehicles on the road for this. Uh, so large part of our business is very dependent on that uh, for this kind of a work. So um, I think uh, that gives us that comfort. Okay. Thank you. And, and congratulations for a great set of numbers, not just for this quarter, but for the last so many quarters. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sandeep Shah from Equity Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity and congrats to the management for a great quarter and a great outlook. Uh, the first question is in terms of uh, the FI23 outlook. Is it factoring a slowdown in the Europe as a geography? Uh, a, because of geopolitical issues, second being rising inflation. Because we are reading that uh, more than uh, Germany may be on a blink of recession and uh, 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 we get a chunk of revenue which is invoiced into zero as a whole. So, do you believe uh, this can lead to some negative surprises, or we are already factoring this into the guidance? And why I'm asking this is uh, even in a COVID time, uh, when the world has gone into recession, uh, we also had an impact despite we may be working on models which are likely to be launched in the future as a whole. So, uh so uh, I, I, uh, it's a valid concern, but I think there are two points I would like to say. First is in case of uh, um, at the time of uh, COVID when our revenues went down for two quarters specifically, it was uh, for three uh, specific clients. And uh, that, uh, that was uh, uh, the impact we had. Uh, it was largely in case of these three specific clients, our revenues had gone down. Uh, most of the impact was due to that. But uh, right now, if you really ask me, I think uh, things have moved uh, much beyond. Actually, uh, the COVID has accelerated these long-term programs. Uh, what uh, the companies uh, are looking at uh, for two things. First is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, they are already late. Uh, they are uh, behind uh, at least four to five years as compared to some of the disruptors 
um, which are uh, eating into their market share, uh, specifically into electrification. And uh, the, the pressure which they will get uh, in terms of uh, retaining their market share as well as uh, changing their business model is uh, uh, very big. So if you look at all the announcement, uh, the large, all the large companies have announced very significant uh, investments for these programs. This is, uh, these are uh, the programs which are long term, which are well funded. And uh, when we have identified our clients, Generally, that is a very specific care we have taken for the companies who can go through and, uh, you know, different periods and uh, sustain these investments. Naturally, to your point, um, uh, I think uh, we work, uh, fortunately, we work in all the geographies. We are very strong in U.S. We are very strong in Asia. And uh, I think we have a balanced growth and portfolio uh, to really take care of any uh, uh, short-term glitches, if any. Okay. Just further to that, whether guidance factors this or as of now, we cannot factor this as none of the client negotiation indicate any macro impact. So we are taken to the best of our understanding right now. Okay. Okay. And just another connected question. Uh, some of your global competitors uh, uh, who also has a higher delivery base in Russia and Ukraine, uh, is there an opportunity for a player like India where I think clients are looking to diversify their uh, delivery base through vendors outside these countries to other countries, including India as well? See, I mean, what we have seen in the past as well as this, uh, many uh, companies do not, uh, in this kind of a strategy program, companies do not move projects uh, with any glitches in some, some of these areas. I mean, there will be some cases where they may ask us for more help, but I think what we believe is that will help us in uh, uh, having more share of new opportunities with the client. That's where we see the opportunity. Okay, okay, okay. And just uh, in SY23, uh, can you share what could be the wage headwind uh, for the whole year? Uh, because I think uh, Mr. Ravi Pandit's comments indicate that because of your new skills, attrition may take another couple of years to calm down. So is it fair to assume SY23 wage heights as a headwind on margin could be higher than SY22? And what could be that quantum and when will it come? And how will you compensate that uh, being factored into the margin guidance? I think we have answered this question already. I think uh, what are the re ways in which we will offset this? Uh, naturally, we have considered that when we have given the guidance. Uh, we, uh, this uh, includes, uh, uh, we have long-term incentives, we have uh, higher increments we have given even last year. I think it will be more in line with the increments we have given last year. Uh, so I think, uh, and uh, we, we have different levels which I just mentioned sometime back. Okay, so, so it may be close to plus or minus 300 basis points. <laughs> yes. Okay. And okay. we will find a way to offset it. Okay. And this last two bookkeeping question, uh, if I look at in a cash flow statement, last two years we are uh, having an outflow worth 25 crores uh, for the uh, non minority in uh, uh, investor payout as a whole. So what are the nature of this payout as a whole? So in the current financial year, there was a minority stake in the company that we acquired in 2017, Microfigy, that was acquired in the first quarter. That was the only uh, investment that we did, and now it is a 100% subsidiary. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. And uh, Madam, just in your guidance, what are you factoring on a uh, cross-currency headwind for FY23 as a whole? So as a FY23 as a whole, we have a target head rate in uh, consideration. As per our forex policy, we have considered the uh, head rate and we are working on the plain vanilla and forward contracts for the same. And that is what we have considered for our annual operating plan. So what I'm asking is the impact on our revenue growth. So from a constant currency growth guidance of 18 to 21 percent, what are you factoring the cross currency again? What could be the reported US dollar growth guidance if you need to convert into that? I think Sandeep, it's very difficult to say what the reported US dollar number would be right now. So that is the very reason why we have talked about safety growth. Okay. Thanks and all the best.
Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vimal Gohil from Union AMC. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity, sir. Uh, most of my questions on the demand environment are answered. Uh, just a balance sheet related question. Uh, basically, what I notice is in your other financial liabilities have gone up quite sharply from 1885 odd crores to 189 crores. And uh, there are higher provisions uh, versus last year from 33 odd crores to 65 crores, uh, which is probably helping some of your uh, cash accretion. If you could just help me, the uh, reason behind the uh, sharp changes here. But the liabilities include primarily two reasons. Uh, one is, as Mr. Patil explained, we have given uh, in terms of our uh, retention strategy some long-term incentives, and those have been accrued in non-current as well as current uh, other liabilities. Apart from that, uh, based on the recent acquisition that we did, there is a non-current, uh, the non-controlling interest is also accrued in the books. Uh, so the majority portion of the increase that you see in the other financial liabilities is basically the uh, accrued incentive cost and the non uh, the non controlling interest purchase. So non controlling interest purchase would be for the FMS acquisition, right? No, that was for past partners uh, where we are consolidating the entity, but uh, it is right now at sixty percent. The balance non controlling interest uh, is forty percent, which is what is uh, being accounted for. Right. And ma'am, uh, what uh, about the higher provisions? Uh, uh, about the sixty-five crores of higher. No, those are normal uh, provisions. If you compare, um, you know, our overall scale that has increased. So for uh, the, the provisions, they are mainly for leave and cashment and gratuity, where the headcount has gone up and so has the wage bill. So it will have right. impact on defer tax assets as well as the provisions. Right, right. Uh, and and sir, uh, just uh, just a question on your 25% volume growth guidance versus a 21% revenue growth guidance on the top end. Uh, basically, this could imply a further increase in offshoring, uh, which uh, which probably explains your uh, bullishness on margin. Uh, but after this, you know, uh, you know, in, uh, could we could we sir, then assume that FY23 will probably see uh, 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 a sort of a ceiling in terms of our uh, offshoring uh, revenues or do we still expect after FY23 do we still expect offshoring to continuously increase? I think uh, it's uh, I, I may say that uh, uh, naturally it will it can't grow with the speed in which uh, it has increased uh, in the last years but there will be opportunity multiple ways uh, in terms of uh, more offshoring, but I'm sure there are other opportunities in some business model, higher realizations in some other ways. Uh, but to your point, offshoring uh, will continue to increase. I mean, that's what uh, we, we think there will be some different business models which are evolving also uh, based on near shore, etc. So, uh, you know, there are uh, some other levels which may come up. Got it, sir. Got it. Uh, 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 and, and sir, uh, just one more question. Uh, basically, uh, uh, the question on revenue per employee was answered, but if I were to look at the cost per employee, uh, is that also explained by uh, uh, higher pressure addition and offshoring, or is there something else to it? Uh, so cost per employee, if I see, has gone down by almost 6.5% on a YY basis. So what explains that? Thank you. Some, so uh, it is mainly uh, pyramid. Uh, it is mainly pyramid. And uh, the other part which we have done uh, is uh, offsh uh, offsh offshoring, yes. uh, where uh, we had mentioned that uh, for many of the projects we were in a position to move people uh, offshore from the onsite. I think both of those things happen. Right. Right. Uh, and sir, uh, uh, lastly, my question on oh, your overall strategy, while I do appreciate you being with the top 25 clients and focusing on them, uh, and mostly most of those clients, I believe, would be the OEMs. Uh, sir, how about targeting some of these global tier one uh, auto ancillaries? Uh, I guess the spending in intensity uh, for some of these auto platforms is also high there. So any intention of getting into those or getting aggressive for getting those clients? When we talk of uh, T25, uh, it has large number of uh, OEMs. It also has some uh, tier one. Uh, 
Um, obviously, when we engage with OEMs, we get long-term visibility of larger programs and we engage with them in a strategic manner. Uh, so obviously, the planning and everything uh, becomes easier working with the uh, OEM. Having said that, there are also a handful of tier ones who take a similar partnership approach. And we've been engaging with them for uh, several years and will continue to do so uh, going forward. Right, right. Great, sir. Thank you so much for answering all my questions. Uh, all the very best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shatej Saraf from, from Task Investments. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I want to know more about the other segment, uh, what clients lie here, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, segment is seeing good growth. So uh, could you mm -hmm. shed some light on the growth prospects and what KPIT is doing for these clients? Uh, sure. I think you're talking about the growth in the other segment, uh, right? And uh, other clients or other, uh, other segments? Yeah. You said pra practices, right? I, and Mr. Pandit, is that correct? You're alluding to practices, right? The growth that you've seen in other practices. So uh, actually, both other practices and clients. Yeah. So, or other other clients, uh, if I'm to narrow it down further. Yeah. So when you say other, uh, what do you mean other than what? Other than T21. Yeah. <laughs> So let me let me address both. So first, uh, speaking of uh, clients, um, as Mr. Patil said, uh, and you know, at, at the beginning, Mr. Pandit also talked about, um, there is this uh, tremendous demand at this point in time from our T25 clients, especially the OEMs. Uh, they need help, and the demand exceeds the supply. Uh, given this, it becomes even more important for us to continue to focus on T25, and that revenue percentage will grow of T25 substantially in the coming year. Um, so I hope that answers your first question. Um, uh, se second question is about others in, in terms of our offerings and practices. Um, Mr. Pandit uh, talked about move towards software-defined vehicles, where we are actually working on the architecture. What happens is when you work on the architecture, uh, it's a program by itself, and once the architecture is in place, different practices, you know, business to the different practices flows, whether it's, um, uh, whether it's uh, autonomous driving or body or some of the other, or even uh, intelligent cockpit. Um, the shift towards software-defined vehicles is actually getting reflected in the growth that you see uh, in the other, coupled by also our, uh, there are fundamental changes in the vehicle because they're becoming, because of case. Um, that has also sort of given uh, traction to our growth when it comes to our vehicle engineering design practice. It's the combination of two, that's why you see uh, very high growth coming from others. Uh, what we'll have to do now, since uh, this is sort of a permanent shift. We'll have to revisit the categorization so that we are able to reflect what we are doing more accurately to all of you. Does that answer your question, or am I making it more complicated for you? Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ramesh Murthy from White Oak Capital. Please go ahead. Murthy, your line is in talk mode. Please go ahead with your question. Mr. Murthy, please unmute your line from your side if muted. As there is no response from the current participant, we'll move on to the next question from the line of Amit Agarwal from Burman Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for taking my questions. First is uh, regarding the TCV announced during the quarter. So of this 125 million, what would be the new deals and what would be the contribution from uh, the renewables? I think uh, we, 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 we would not uh, be in a position to give that. Uh, we, will, uh, uh, we, we, we would uh, report every quarter the total deals when, uh, one includes the uh, new as well as renewables. Okay, uh, but in terms of uh, will, will the majority will be from new deals? In any broader indication? Things are, I think uh, the, the reason why it's very difficult for us to give you the breakup is because it's, it's mixed. 
more and more uh, engagements that we work on, they are actually transforming into larger work, so it's very difficult to segregate for us. That's, uh, you know, that's kind of uh, difficult for us to uh, break down for you even further. Got it. And any any, any broader color in terms of uh, the same number, how this has grown year on year or sequentially how this number has grown? As Mr. Patil said, you know, from as compared to where we were uh, a year ago, uh, there is no dramatic shift. I think, uh, you know, at this point, we just feel that uh, the guidance is it's sufficient for the guidance that we have provided for the year. Got it. And the last question from my side, uh, sequentially, how the velocity in the pipeline uh, for the new deals have changed uh, sequentially? I think... Uh, uh, what what we see is uh, um, all the discussions, all the uh, opportunities. Uh, we see a very strong demand. That's what uh, Mr. Tikekar uh, 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 he was alluding to. And uh, so there is a pipeline, and there is a certain discussions uh, which tells us uh, that uh, very high uh, growth environment from our existing client. And has this uh, further improved sequentially? You know, I think, uh, it, it, as, as Mr. Patil said, I think the demand continues to grow every quarter. It's just that we have to be very mindful about creating long-term value for our clients. So the business that we want to engage that will, will actually consider in the pipeline is going to be constrained by the supply that we have. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Danshri from Anvil Share and Stock Broking. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, co yes. Am I audible? Yeah. Congrats yes. for the good set of numbers for the management. Yeah, my question is again on the demand side. Uh, I would like to understand how do we see like uh, growth for KPI from medium to long term, considering the long term projects that we are seeing currently in automotive. Uh, I wish to understand how the spends are happening. If you give some color on how that would happen in on why on why terms in next couple of years, and some color on the nature, the kind of spend that are happening in automotive, that would be helpful. Yes, I spent some time uh, in my earlier comments about uh, what is changing in the world of automotive. Um, we believe that uh, uh, the changes in the automotive are driven by software. Uh, we believe that um, the industry is changing, the structure of the industry is changing, and uh, there is a huge role uh, for us to play in that. Uh, the reports that have come about the overall software domain uh, from multiple external agencies talk about multi-billion dollar market. Not all of that belongs to us, but you know a large part of that is accessible to us. So on a long-term demand uh, basis, uh, we really see uh, no issue on demand. Uh, our concern, as my colleagues have been talking about, is how do we deliver on our promise to our customers uh, so that uh, you know he succeeds in his marketplace. So our concerns really are on the supply side. And I also spoke about what is it that we are doing to ensure that we deliver value to our clients. Okay. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I think we have already overshot on the time. We will just take one more question. And uh, please, if you have any more questions, uh, please feel free to write to me. And I'll be happy to get back to you. Should we take the last question? Yes, we can take one more question and then I think we should stop. The next question is from the line of Pankaj Kumar, individual investor. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh... Thanks for taking my question. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so my question is regarding the guidance. Uh, you have given a guidance, uh, revenue growth guidance of 18 to 21 percent, and the volume growth guidance of 25 percent. Uh, so, so my question is uh, with, with increased offshoring, uh, the guided margin of sales remain the same, 18 to 19 percent band. Uh, are you being conservative over here? Uh, because in the last year, 
uh, with 19.5% revenue growth and 28% volume growth, uh, the margin has improved by 300 BPS. Uh, so uh, that is my question. Uh, are you being conservative over here in the guidance, uh, margin guidance? So uh, we are, uh, as, as we talked about, and actually many people ask about the questions is in the, in the increasing cost, uh, how we will maintain the margin. So I think this is one of the levers we have. I think uh, so uh, we have considered uh, uh, different costs uh, which uh, we may have to incur. Uh, apart from the fact, I think there are three areas in which we continue to invest uh, much more than our increase in the revenue. So one is the technology. Uh, we have uh, new practice areas. Uh, we continue to invest uh, consistently, and that is uh, higher. Is specifically looking at the transformation which is happening, which is higher than our revenue growth uh, generally. So that is one area. Uh, the second is the infrastructure and technology areas. Uh, I think that is uh, again uh, area where we invest. And the third is of course uh, uh, cost uh, on the uh, uh, people side. So looking at all this, I think uh, uh, we have uh, uh, this. This will uh, on, on based on that we have factored this in when we are given the margin. Okay, sure. Thank you. I have just one more question. What is the offshore on-site ratio um, uh, in quarter four? We uh, we do not give these numbers uh, as we have said uh, that uh, the way our programs happen and uh, they, at different points of time it happens differently. So I think uh, we we have not never given these numbers. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take that as a last question. I would now like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. So thank you very much for your active participation on the call. And uh, again, I would request you that if you still have any more questions, please uh, feel free to write to me, and I'll be happy to answer all of them. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Ladies thank and gentlemen, you. on behalf of Dollar Capital, that concludes this conference call. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.